Uh, good evening, everyone. Here, Imran Abbas uh, again. Uh, we are live. Uh, we are live on GLR TV today. I will interview such a person who is a great inspiration for myself. I have started bariatric surgery since uh, 2005, but little, not much more. But after 2010, yes, I was a as an active bariatric surgeon, and I remember at that time. So my inspiration, and the person who was a great inspiration for myself, Professor Mufazal Takrawala. Uh, he's a great name in uh, bariatric uh, surgery, and uh, you all know better than me, Professor is his uh, contribution for promotion of bariatric surgery, not only in India, at the globe, all over the world. Uh, so it was great opportunity for me to interview such a great personality. We have started this interview series of a sleeve gastrectomy since July 2021. We have started this series with uh, Professor Patrick Noel, and we will continue this series till December. In December, we will have some obsession why we have started this series, safe a sleeve gastrectomy. So still sleep gastrectomy is the most common bariatric surgery at this globe, but unfortunately we are facing some issues. So like GERD after surgery, weight regain after surgery, leak after surgery and bleeding and many. So what is the, what we are trying our best to convey the message by someone who are really legend, who are really expert of bariatric surgery, especially sleep gastrectomy, how we must do a sleeve, then we will face less complication. Sir, it is great honor for me, really great honor, and I am excited to hear from your side. Sir, over to you. Uh, Salam alaikum, uh, Imran, and it's a pleasure to be here with you on TV. And uh, like you said, uh, forget sleeve gastrectomy alone. Any kind of surgery should be safe and more so bariatric surgery, because so far people are yet to accept bariatric surgery as a life-saving surgery. They believe that it is a life-changing surgery, but not a life-saving surgery. And therefore, anything you do in the space of bariatric surgery can ill afford to have complications. And therefore, I believe that the safest bariatric surgery is always the best bariatric surgery. Sir, definite. Sir, as you know, so because we have some uh, repeated questions, uh, I personally, I know in many of all of us, uh, uh, so what again, uh, so because this is a routine, sir, your brief introduction. Uh, I'm Dr. Mufazal Lakhtawala from uh, Mumbai, India. Uh, I'm a great friend of Imran and uh, in this space of it, my specialization is minimal access surgery and more than 50 to 60% of my case volume uh, includes bariatric surgery. I do a lot of endoscopic uh, management of bariatric surgery complications as well, as well as a lot of revisional, more than 10% of my volume of bariatric surgery today is revisional bariatric surgery. So excellent. This was a short, but uh, uh, so very, uh, very effective. Uh, so sir, uh, we are also interested to know about your bariatric surgery journey. What is your journey of bariatric surgery when and uh, why you have started? So Imran, like you, I started uh, probably in November of 2004. I started by training with Professor Piet Patta from uh, the University of Ghent in Belgium. Uh, where I saw a couple of bands done by him. And then I came and placed a couple of bands in India in November and December of 2004. And I soon realized that banding would not be as effective in the Indian population as something else. Then I got an opportunity to meet Professor Raul Rosenthal, my very close friend and mentor and teacher uh, at, at Seoul, at the Thought Leaders Summit held by Johnson & Johnson in 2004. Uh, I requested him that can I come and learn the gastric bypass and he kind of consented being the great guy that he is. I went off to see him and it is quite funny because the first couple of days when I went to see him in uh, Florida, he had got this vertigo and I thought that that's done. My trip is all of five days and this guy's already got vertigo for two days. 
and Samuel Somsi, who was his junior at that point of time, saw a couple of cases with him. And uh, soon enough, Rahul came back and uh, I saw three cases. And so all my experience of having seen and learned bariatric surgery was three cases of bending with Professor Pete Patta and maybe four cases of gastric bypass with Rahul Rosenthal and Samuel Somsi. And that was my training in bariatric surgery. I came soon and started the first gastric bypass. And I do remember it took me eight to nine hours from the first case. And recently I operated that same uh, girl for a gallbladder. And uh, it was great to see her that she still managed to maintain all that weight loss despite uh, 16 years or so of uh, my first gastric bypass. Uh, after that, uh, I soon moved on to doing uh, sleeve gastrectomy somewhere in 2008 or 2009. And uh, as would have it, moved into the single incision sleeves and single incision gastric bypasses soon after, only because a lot of young girls in India didn't want to say that they had bariatric surgery. And that's how I ingenuated and, and found ways of trying to hide the scar within the belly button and uh, started the single incision sleeve. And at one point of time, we did probably the largest number of single incision sleeves in the world, published data back proven that it was a safe and effective method. Uh, soon enough, uh, the complications of sleeves just started emerging in terms of reflux, in terms of leaks, and various other things. And uh, we started doing interluminal stenting, interluminal plugging of the sleeve leaks, and various other things. And learned in our journey of sleeves that a sleeve leak is the one of the most deadliest complications that you can deal with. Soon enough, the chronic complications of sleeve leaks, like the uh, gastrocolic fistulas, the gastrocutaneous fistulas, gastrobronchial fistulas started emerging. So uh, weight regain started and then we started moving our journey from uh, the sleeve to the bypass and thought that banding the bypass would probably give us uh, answers. So we started with the banding the bypass and uh, soon enough realized that the band though looks very Thing in the beginning has its own set of evils as well. Band erosions, band slippage, internal hernias, band, these are all known complications. Then after that, around that time, I started the single anastomosis gastric bypass, uh, the OAGP, which was around the corner, and uh, got very good effective weight loss results, good effective uh, results in terms of uh, diabetes remission and various other things. But one problem that we did face with them was bile reflux. We did face a lot of marginal ulcers, iron deficiencies, and uh, dyspepsia that was not previously seen with the, the, the bypass, the Ruamai gastric bypass. So I learned my lessons from the OEGB as well as the banded bypass, and then started uh, doing a Ruamai bypass with the biliopancreatic limb of 200. And soon enough realized that we didn't have the dyspepsia, we didn't have as many marginal ulcers as we had with the OEGB. The bile was not that big a concern. And now my standard procedure remains a 200 centimeter iliopancreatic limb with a 75 centimeter elementary limb of a gastric bypass. Uh, sleeves still do happen. There is uh, a place and time for the OAGP, the Ruamai gastric bypass, and uh, the sleeve. If you're asking a lot of people, think in terms of the endoscopic sleeve, well, that's an attractive option for the lower BMI patients, but not necessarily for those patients who are 40 and above BMI. Remember that you need something. Recently, we've also had the addition of semaglutide in our armamentarium. And so all those patients who've had weight regain after that, I would recommend that you consider putting your patients on glutide or semaglutide. And uh, there are newer exciting drugs that are coming, which are promising you between 17 to 25% total body weight loss. It comes almost close to surgery. <laughs> so I, I believe that uh, bariatric surgery is in a very exciting space. Well, a lot of hybrid procedures will come in between drugs as well as medications. Well, I've done my share of SARDIS. I've done my share of BPD and the duodenal switches. I would recommend that any patient who's not going to be able to follow guidelines, not be able to take proteins, you be very, very careful when you do a SARDI or this thing or a duodenal switch because you'll end up burning your hands. All patients will say they'll follow, but then they don't follow. And, and it's a nightmare to manage nutritional complications in a patient who's... Uh, not uh, compliant with taking proteins as well as micronutrients and multivitamins. 
uh, Imran, that's been my journey. Uh, yeah, sir, excellent. So excellent, sir, excellent. And also, so now more than one decade, uh, you are practicing as a bariatric surgeon and still 50 to 60%, as you have mentioned, your practice belongs to bariatric surgery. So, sir, which percentage do you, in this uh, 50 to 60%, which percentage of bariatric surgery belongs to sleep gastrectomy still in 2021? Uh, I'm supposed to speak about the, the safest sleeve. And at one point of time, I was probably doing the largest number of sleeves in, in Asia, uh, Imran, when I started my career. Uh, unfortunately, I must say that I've shifted a lot of my practice to the to my gastric bypass now. And sleeve gastrectomy forms less than, uh, a standard sleeve forms less than 5% completely gone different from what the U.S. has gone, where the U.S. has gone completely towards the sleeve, going away from the Ruama gastric bypass. I believe in, in India, in Asia, at least in Pakistan and various other places, a bypass, whichever way you're comfortable with the OAGB or the Ruama, remains a far better op operation for diabetes uh, remission, for metabolic surgery, metabolic factor remission than a sleeve alone. Sleeve is a great starting point but at some point you would start getting the refluxes in, you'd start getting the weight regainers in. So be careful not to recommend this leaf for all comers. Uh, choose your patients wisely, choose the volumeters, and okay. choose those patients who can exercise and diet and follow your instructions post-operatively for the sleeves. Or uh, three to five years later, you'll have a lot of patients you need revision of surgery on. Uh, excellent. Sir, this interview series, what is our target? So this is in light mode, not like a webinar. And the main target is sharing your personal knowledge and your personal experience. So my question, definite, as you have mentioned, so especially single uh, incision uh, uh, sleeve gastrectomy, you have a maximum number at the globe. Still, you prefer to do this? If you not, why? I, I believe the single incident sleeve is a great procedure. Okay, single incident bypass, I do a lot now as well. It's a great procedure for patients who want anonymity, don't want to reveal that they've had bariatric surgery. Today, uh, you can mix and match it. If you're not very comfortable with the single incident approach only, you can mix and match it with the mini lap instruments, which are 3mm instruments, which hardly leave any scars. Uh, but yes, uh, the results are the same. We've proven it that whether it's a five-pot sleeve, a three-pot sleeve, or a single incident sleeve, the results are the same in terms of weight loss, in terms of uh, metabolic uh, parameter remission, in terms of weight regain, in terms of reflux, and everything else. Safety parameters are the same. So you don't get more leaks, you don't get more bleeds. So if you can manage to hide your scars and uh, give the same kind of result, then it's worth it. But you have to pick and select your patients, at least initially when you're doing it. Make sure that you pick the low PMIs, uh, less than 40, pick the females more than the males, because even the males with 40 BMI sometimes can have really big livers and can be difficult. And uh, do it as long as you feel safe. Don't uh, shy away from putting an additional troca if you get stuck in a problem. And try and keep uh, someone who's done single incident surgeries around with you, at least for the first few cases. Sir, excellent. Uh, sir, regarding so evolution of technique, uh, definite we are surgeon and any type of surgery, it will be lab, coli, hernia, or any type. Progressively, we learn also from ourselves. And definitely we change our some technique, some uh, maneuver. So can you highlight that evolution of your technique for a sleep gastrectomy to decrease the chance of complication and better results? I think first and foremost, uh, Imran, I would select the right patient. Like I said, uh, be careful of which patients you select. Don't, if you're doing early sleeves, don't select the super, super obese. Though that might be the ideal indication for a sleeve gastrectomy. Next thing is prepare your patients well. So make sure they've had some liquid diet and don't ask your patient to have a biryani and come the next day. And get away once, twice, thrice get stuck in with a very, very and you might not be able to uh, accomplish as safe surgery as you want. Now, as far as the sleeve goes, I have followed two or three very, very basic steps. Use one instrument which you're comfortable with, all right? Either the harmonic or the ligature. 
whichever you're comfortable with. Nikki Shaw is, is equally good because it kind of is, acts as a very, very effective sealant. So if you're comfortable, especially in patients who have got cirrhosis, please use a Nikki Shaw, don't use a harmonic because these veins, the short gastrics can bleed torrential. I usually always start uh, on the greater curvature exactly opposite the uh, incisura and make a window and progress uh, upwards. I first take two centimeters just below because sometimes when you're dissecting upwards, it suddenly starts bleeding from down near the gastroepiploic. Uh, dissect the uh, gastrosplenic as well as the short gastrics very close to the stomach surface. Remember that this greater coverage of the stomach is going to go off. When you're retracting near the first short gastrics, please be careful because sometimes if you do something like a zipper cut, it can bleed torrentially and cause damage from the upper pole of the spleen and the, the vessel is very close to that. Sometimes uh, the upper pole, upper splenic vessel can arise out of one of the short gastrics and you can get a small infarcted area near the upper pole of the spleen. There's nothing much to worry about. When you're using a harmonic, make sure that the hot blade of the harmonic does not touch the pancreas because that causes higher chances of splenic vein thrombosis and various other complications that can happen with the sleep. Uh, when you're dissecting the the, the, near the first short gastric, make sure that all the posterior adhesions of the pancreas are taken off and you've lifted the complete fundus of the stomach up. Uh, I usually always stop my dissection when I go to the base of the left crust and the right crust. If I can identify that, if there's any fat herniating down, then I dissect more aggressively to bring that fat down. If not, then I stop there because the more you, uh, I've learned it myself the hard way, the more you dissect the phrenoesophageal ligament and the phrenoiotic li ligament, there's a higher chance of reflux in the post-operative period. So if you don't see any fat herniating at the base of the left and right plus, just leave it there. And that's your maximum point of dissection. Uh, some surgeons prefer taking anteriorly the fat, Belsi pad of fat and dissecting it free. Uh, with the kind of staplers that we have available today, it's not necessary. Then you turn your attention downwards and dissect all the adhesions of the pancreas, completely lift the antrum so that you can dissect it. Go very close. I usually stop my dissection around two centimeters away from the pyloric ring. Uh, my stapler, my first uh, stapler, it usually comes from my left side, uh, right side, sorry, uh, port and uh, I angle it. I do not put in a bougie before I fire the first stapler. Some surgeons might prefer putting in the bougie right into the duodenum and fire close. The reason why I don't do it is because all good sleeves are hockey shaped. Remember that when you go very tight to the pylorus, it does not give you any additional benefits. So a couple of papers have shown it. And what's more, it can cause an angulation at the incisura, which can cause all sorts of problems in terms of leaks, in terms of reflux, in terms of twisting of your sleeve. Uh, the next step, uh, you can use either a black cartridge if you think your stomach is very, very thick, a green cartridge, or a purple cartridge if you're using a tri state Try not to use blue or tan out over here or a white cartridge because the antrum of the stomach is very thick. Now comes the most important step of the sleeve gastrectomy. That's the incisura. Remember, if you tinker with the incisura and go too close to it, uh, and you get twisting of the sleeve there, that's when all your problems with sleeve will start. You can either get a, a leak higher up because of the back pressure, or you can get reflux in the long term, or you can get food bolus obstruction, continuous vomiting, and you can get twisting of the sleeve. So I prefer leaving a 0.5 centimeter area around the incisura, which does not cause any weight regain, but allows my bougie to pass easily. This is the time before I fire around the second cartridge. I use the bougie. Uh, if you're using a tri staple, use the purple out over here. If you're using other cartridges, it's safe enough to use a blue out over here. Uh, and if you're not comfortable, some people use gold as well. So you can use whichever you want. Uh, now comes the play area where you need to start making your sleeve nice and snug around the bougie. Your bougie size can vary from between 38 to 36 French bougie. Anything bigger than that, you're leaving already too much of a sleeve. Now, the important thing is not the type of bougie that you put, because some surgeons put in a 20, 32 French bougie and say that we we make a very small bougie, but if you leave it loose around the bougie, it makes no sense. Uh, it should not go too tight to the bougie. It should just be snug. So when you fire your stapler, your assistant should give traction on the greater curvature and pull it downwards and outwards. Remember that when you fired your cartridge, the, the staple row should be facing the lateral wall near the spleen. 
it should not be twisted up or down. Because once it's twisted up or down, that means you've already gone wrong on your straight press. As long as it's facing flat towards the lateral wall, uh, towards the diaphragm and the spleen, that means you're correct. When you you go up along the booty, make it snug. Uh, if it's too fatty a patient, too obese a patient, sometimes you can't see the blood vessels up and down. Make sure you don't twist it around the sleeve. Some surgeons prefer pushing the bougie up and down every time they fire a stapler. It's not necessary as long as you've gone past the incisura into the antrum. Uh, you, can, you can just stay with that and you'll be pretty okay. When you come towards the last firing, that's where you have to be careful that you don't leave a boggy fundus behind. At the same time, you don't go onto the esophagus. You have to leave a tiny little dog here. Now, this dog here is very important because if you go flush to the uh, G junction, remember that 3% of all individuals have a lack of blood supply at the OG junction, which is natural. So if your bad day is there and you've gone flat there, you might have a lack of blood supply, your staplers might not hold, or you've gone too tight to the incisure, the back pressure gives way, and that's where you'll get the leak. Uh, after having done this, what I always do is I take two zero PDS and I imbricate my entire staple line. So I imbricate by taking the dog ear and putting it inside so that in case there is a back pressure change or something, it goes. I then imbricate my entire staple line by taking the omentum and doing an omentopexy right from top to bottom. When I come closer to the mid part of the sleeve and closer to the incisura, I take the peripancreatic fascia. Now, this is the important one. Uh, you don't take too deep so that you go into the pancreas. At the same time, you take this peripancreatic fascia because that keeps the sleeve honest and prevents twisting and torsion of the sleeve. That's the only fibrotic tissue there, which is hard enough and stays there. If you just do an omentopexy, you might prevent it from, uh, it's unlikely that you'll prevent it from twisting because it's not strong enough. Uh, you can suture either through and through, or you can take uh, angle sutures where there is an angle of your staple line. With the omentopexy, I come right down so that I, I don't have any problems because post-operative bleeding can sometimes occur from the staple line if the BP goes up in the post-op period. By doing omentopexy and imbricating the staple line, you're safe. You'll never ever get a post-operative bleeding. Um, after having done this, I inspect my staple line after removing the bougie for any further bleeding. If there is none, I pass the bougie again. I never uh, do the leak test because I'm pretty confident once I've implicated that there's no need for a leak test. Uh, then I turn my attention by removing the sleeve specimen from the right mid clavicle. And uh, those, both my 12 mm trocars. So I use 12, two 12 mm trocars and three 5 mm trocars when I'm doing a five pot sleeve. In a single pot, I use one five mm and one 12 mm trocar. Uh, that's what I use. For the liver retraction, sometimes I stitch the liver up or I use a three mm uh, striker instrument to retract the liver. So that's how I do. I don't leave any drains. I don't leave any rice tubes uh, or nasogastric tubes in place. Uh, so Imran, that's what I do. I always do a Conray study the next post-op day just to make sure there's no leak. My patients go into orals around 100 ml of clear fluids the next day and are discharged the next afternoon. Sir, excellent, really. Now, completely, I can imagine about your technique. Sir, have you any video? Are you trusted to share any video, short video? I don't have it on me here, Iran, but I can always send it to you. You can uh, join, mm -hmm. join no in the link. No issue, sir. Sir, excellent. So, as because we also, uh, in, at this channel, so we have a lot of youngsters, uh, viewers are youngsters, and you have highlighted excellent points. So, to distance first stapler from pylorus in Cicero Angularis, that you have highlighted the most important point, and also EG junction. And also, when you are going to staple, so be careful, don't twist your this sleeve, it must be symmetrical and also mentopexy and embrication. Sir, my question regarding your this technique, when you have finalized this technique, how long time you have finalized uh, this? After my first uh, 50 cases of sleeve, uh, I, I've had in a total of maybe over 4,000 odd sleeves that I would have done in run. I've, I've had three leaks and they all happened in my first 50 cases. After the 50th sleeve, when I uh, had a leak, uh, I inspected the video and it looked absolutely normal. As if I'd done the only thing. 
but that time I wasn't implicating, I wasn't doing omentopexies. From that day onwards, I decided to do that. And after that, I've had no leaks. So uh, inshallah, I shouldn't have if I do any further, but that's that's the reason why I took uh, and implicate all my uh, staple lines now. Sir, my question, so after uh, finalizing this technique, so because now you have finalized your technique definite, uh, so have you faced any leak or uh, bleeding after finalizing this technique? No, after after that, like I said, it's over close to 4,000 sleeves. After the first 50, I've not had any leaks or bleeds at all. Excellent, sir. Excellent. So, definite. So, this is a great lesson, great message for our youngster. If you follow proper technique, so a sleeve is a good surgery. So, it's still a sleeve at the globe is the most common surgery. And also, if you follow these points, so it depends on you. You can follow but professor is here and when after 4,000 cases, there is no leak, no bleeding, definite. This is safe sleeve gastrectomy. Sir, what is your protocol regarding pre-op endoscopy and also post-op surveillance in uh, sleeve gastrectomy? It's a very good question, Imran, because uh, before we never used to do pre-op endoscopy as a routine, but now it's, it's part and parcel of my... Uh, pre-op uh, investigation because pre-op endoscopy in a sleeve is very essential. Let's say if you have a large hiatal hernia or you have Barrett's esophagus, then in my mind, uh, sleeve gastrectomy becomes a contraindication. You know, there are surgeons who say you can always do uh, hiatoplasty and you can suture. Remember that whenever the weight loss happens, there's always a migration of the sleeve upwards towards the chest and Barrett's esophagus doesn't get better. <coughs> so, Please be careful. Remember that a lot of people blame the single anastomosis gastric bypass for a mixed refluxate, like the bile and acid that comes up after, after the OHEV. I would say that in, in sleeves as well, you get a lot of bile sometimes up in the esophagus as well. Uh, so pH manometry studies will also show you that there is alkaline reflux in a sleeve as well, along with the acid. So if you're doing it in a large hiatus hernia, if you're doing it... Uh, well, my friend Camila Bodza will say that you can always put uh, a metallic ring around it and the, and the new ones that they have, which is the links. But I would wait to see a few years down because to me, anything other than a proper anti-reflux procedure is not going to help in an obese patient. Sir, excellent. Sir, if, uh, so what about H. pylori eradication? H. pylori eradication, uh, especially in areas like us in India, Pakistan, UAE and everything, an average 30% is seen in the population, right? General population. I think uh, what I do is I, I always look for H. pylori when I'm doing my scopies pre-op. So most of these patients on the 15th day are placed on anti-H. pylori therapy. Or then if we have got two weeks prior to that, then they are put on H. pylori therapy two weeks prior to the surgery. But uh, I don't know whether it really matters in a sleeve. It's always safer to put someone on anti-H pylori once you know that they are positive. Why, sir? Why you eradicate H pylori? See, it doesn't matter too much with the, uh, with the sleeve because marginal ulcers and all are not known with the sleeve because you're still having a stomach. But uh, if uh, you were to do a gastric bypass, then it makes that much more sense. Or an OEGB, it makes that much more sense to eradicate. So with the sleeve, you're eradicating it only because it's not a good organism to have. Sir, what about post-op surveillance, endoscopy? Because now GERD is also an issue after a sleeve gastrectomy. Are you follow? Yes, I've published papers on this as well, uh, Iran. Uh, I, I recommend that all my patients at one year, three year and five year have a surveillance endoscopy, especially those people who've had some degree of reflux. Unfortunately, uh, sometimes patients do come only when they get symptoms. And when you do uh, patients with sleep, uh, like fingers, I used to dissect a lot, very aggressive with my in the beginning. And that's the less people there. Don't, if you don't see fat going up, because you will get a lot of reflux in the long term. And the reflux, sometimes patients present with food coming out of their nose, out of their mouth. And that's a very dangerous area. So you'll see grade three, grade four, uh, parasesophagitis. You'll see a 
uh, a complete migration of the upper end of the sleeve upwards. So the only way to correct that is probably to do a higher plastic and to convert to a gastric bypass. Lynx has got some place. I've never tried it. And that's only for people who've done links to tell you whether there is any chance. Sir, now you did uh, more than 4,000 uh, sleep gastrectomy. So which percentage have you followed endoscopically after sleep? Because most of the 10 years back, uh, Imran, we've got at least 50 to 60% of these people who've come at some point of time in this entire journey. So we've got almost 60 to 70% uh, of our patients following up with us. Sir, what was the most common finding, endoscopic finding after a sleep? What was the most common finding? Most common was uh, migration of the sleeve upwards into the hiatus and what mm -hmm. some people might mistake as a hiatal hernia, but it's actually migration of the sleeve upwards and esophagitis. And esophagitis. In which percentage, if we ask, so it was 20%, 30%, round about? You, if you compare the pre-op versus the post-op, there's at least a 15 to 20% higher risk of uh, esophagitis after a sleep. Sir, have you faced any time buried esophagus, uh, esophagitis? Yes. How many, how many? So you can say that almost 5% of my cases have probably gone on towards Barrett's after a sleep. And that was a short or a long, uh, uh, so this uh, segment? Usually they are usually in the lower and mid esophagus, not very long. Beyond that. That is short. Uh, so because if we see, so this 5% is uh, a big number. So if uh, at least if you follow about 2000 or uh, 2000 plus cases endoscopically and 5% of this, if it is Barrett, okay, short is not going to malignant. There is less chance of uh, malignancy in short segment uh, uh, Barrett as compared to long and also in our area in Asia Pacific, so as compared to European countries, because in European there is more chance of long segment. Uh, but uh, sir, if you faced such a situation, then you convert to Ruan Vigastric Bypass. Uh, no, I would do surveillance. So if there's any metaplasia on the Barrett's, then I would probably recommend a conversion to uh, gastric bypass definitely. If not, you can use a gold probe and try and burn it and see do surveillance every six months or one year. And if the metaplasia is worsening, then of course we need to do something. If not, then you can, uh, you can afford to hold on if the, if the patient is not very symptomatic. Sir, uh, so, so because you are following your patients and uh, sometimes patient has no symptoms uh, after a sleep, there is no GERD after a sleep and you did endoscopy and that was an uh, incidental finding. Uh, that was also buried, also it was as a vaginitis, but there was no complaint of uh, <laughs> after a sleep gastrectomy. Have you faced and how many percentage that was, uh, so we can ask de novo or something like this? So majority of the patients who've got findings of esophagitis and everything are symptomatic. You can say that 10 to 15% of these are asymptomatic. Yeah. So due to this, so we can finalize. So this uh, post of why I am asking these questions because nowadays, uh, so our youngsters, especially in our area, they have started to do a sleeve gastrectomy, but there is no follow-up. Uh, so this uh, follow-up, this bariatric surgery is not like a just lab coli or hernia. This is lifelong follow-up. Uh, so then we will miss the patients and then maybe patient in future will uh, so face a, a, a more critical situation if we, we go earlier and we diagnose earlier than definite, uh, we can prevent uh, such a disaster. Uh, are you agree, sir? A hundred percent. You're quite correct. You have to do, uh, bariatric surgery is a lifelong uh, 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 combination or a lifelong association. So any patient who forgets you after bariatric surgery is doing it at his own uh, detriment. And if you forget your patients, again, you will have a lot of patients going to some other surgeon with these problems, trust me. Yeah. And sir, now you recommend uh, this uh, surveillance uh, six months after surgery, one year after surgery? I think one year is a safe enough time. One year, three years, five years is what I use. It's good, it's good. And if patient is symptomatic, so we can go earlier or then we can schedule. Yes. Yeah, it's if good. the patient is symptomatic, 100%, you can just go ahead and plan. Yeah. 
sir what's your opinion and also we not uh, we we are uh, we are interested to know about your relative and absolute you have already you have mentioned so barrett is your absolute contraindication uh, of a sleeve gastrectomy but what is uh, uh, relative contraindication of a sleeve like hiatal hernia hiatal hernia which size of hiatal hernia if as a phagite so till which grade you are not interested to go for a sleeve gastrectomy anything about grade b i would not do anything with a hills uh, of more than 3 i would not do anything with a hiatus hernia more than 3 cm i would not do uh, that's my relative contraindication another relative contraindication is uh, child c child uh, b with ascites um then uh, any patient with psychiatric uh, problems any patient who's uh, on substance abuse uh so those are the relative contraindication for someone who wants to be pregnant in the next few months again is a relative contraindication sir what about uh, this uh, uh, chain smokers uh, are you prefer a sleeve gastrectomy and patient is not willing to discontinue smoking the what happens is uh around where you stay and where you practice both from your origin country as well as where you currently practice most of them are chain smokers right and that becomes a huge problem because most obese people have a higher propensity towards developing a <coughs> deep vein thrombosis and has the risk at least 3 to 4 times as a, as a smoker and you were to it raises the anesthesia risk raises the lung complication and worse off what it can do is it can increase your chances of deep vein thrombosis so you have a higher chance remember that the splenic vein thrombosis or portal vein thrombosis after a spleen is not because of smoking it's because of dehydration so with deep vein thrombosis you have to differentiate that that from the splenic vein thrombosis splenic vein is because of dehydration deep vein thrombosis can be because of dehydration mainly is because of smoking oc pills uh, uh, inherent cancer or obesity you know sir any time have you faced uh, this portal vein thrombosis because you have highlighted in your patients yes i have faced it in one patient uh, unfortunately we lost that patient uh, patient presented around the 8th day post op uh, with splenic vein and portal vein thrombosis went very aggressively we had we tried to resuscitate but needed a lot of volume but we lost him within 12 hours of presenting to us so how can we prevent so when patient will discharge routinely patient next day one night stay and also next day we discharge the patient are you suggest your patients for uh, uh, rehydration or for iv therapy so any 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 protocol in these cases so most patients discharge the next day so usually what happens is we always tell our patients if you can't consume too much or if you're vomiting for some reason please come back to us earlier so that we can hydrate you all those patients with the higher creatinine are not discharged the next day in our protocol they are kept for at least 3 to 4 days to make sure that they get some form of iv therapy despite the fact that they're taking oral uh, all those super obese patients are put on uh, dvt prophylaxis so we usually put them remember that we don't put anybody on low molecular heparin above patients below 125 low molecular heparin points uh, od those patients above 25 as we put them on heparin 5000 units subcut because that seemed to act much better and faster than low molecular heparin and the company monograph itself says that above 125 kilos they don't have too much data there uh, the next thing is uh, we give a bd dose to all those people above bmr 50 uh, uh, we, we usually discharge these patients on oral either eliquis or seralto Uh, when they go home, uh, if they are super obese for more than uh, two to three weeks, if they are not super obese for seven days, sir, excellent, sir, sir, because you, we also know about you, you have a uh, excellent experience about morbid, morbid obese patients. So, what is my question regarding insufflation? Just imagine a patient with three hundred kg, and also that pedunculated tummy till knees. How you insufflate? the biggest problem usually you'll see is the pudor and problem that you'll get in these patients who are super super obese the the skin is like stone it's very hard and very difficult so i would not recommend that you operate on these patients straight away 
please optimize these patients. Please make sure that you put the patient because a lot of these patients have got uh, core pulmonary. They've got right-sided heart failure. So you will need to manage their fluid and electrolytes uh, with an expert uh, nephrologist along with you and an endocrinologist because usually even the TSH levels are not within range and stuff like that. Uh, once you've controlled that, uh, either with uh, liquid diet and a calorie control diet, uh, and you feel that the skin is more subtle, then I think it becomes much easier because most of our trochas are in the upper abdomen. Forget about the paniculus below and don't even go close to that. Again, sir, this is a very tight. And also if you see, so really, because I have faced such a situation, why I am asking this question, very difficult. Because so this, due to this heavy weight, just you imagine something, so retracting downward. So yes, our port is upward. Yes, I understand, but much difficult. Another thing, Imran, the direction of which you put your trocars, don't put them straight. Put them in the direction in which you want to operate. So my right uh, mid-clavicular port usually goes in the direction of the uh, uh, right left crust. My left mid-clavicular troca goes in the direction of the uh, mid. -clavicular. So that is usually the direction of the trocars have to be correct because the moment the direction of the trocars go wrong, bariatric surgery is a nightmare. Yeah. That's what you, I always teach my youngsters that if you put your troca wrong, remove it and put it back in again. Don't try and manage it without that. Sir, excellent. Sir, definitely we are scientists also. And uh, as uh, you, your follow up is excellent because 50 to 60 or 70 percent follow up, it is amazing. Which percentage of your patient are suffering with weight regain? In a sleeve, to be honest, uh, massive weight regainers for the super obese, most of them regain the weight. You can say that more than 80% of them regain the weight uh, in the super obese, right? If you're doing a sleeve alone. If in uh, you're doing in a BMI of around 40 and above, more than 30% of them will regain, 30 to 40% of them will regain weight. If it's a BMI below that, then usually less than 10% of them will regain a significant amount of weight. Some degree of weight regain, everybody does. Um, but massive, if you a correctly done sleeve, if you've done a sleeve with a large fund, neo fundus, or you've done with a large antrum, then it's of course only different. Then there's massive weight regain. So definitely, then sir, we can ask, so in a super obese patient, sleeve is like a stage surgery. So we will do surgery. We can convince the patient, yes, you will lose the weight and also you need another surgery. A lot of these people, when you need to operate Imran, is the time when the patient plateaus and starts gaining even that one or two kilos back again. That's usually plateaus around the year, year and a half after your first sleeve. But when your patient doesn't come back to you, that's when there is trouble. Because then they sometimes tend to stay back and gain back weight. And when that weight gain comes back, they sometimes gain so much weight that they actually reach very close to where we started from. And then to do a diurnal switch or a sadi in that patient becomes very difficult. So which procedure, sir, you are, uh, so because especially in weight regain cases, just I am asking nowadays, so because definite uh, you are facing and these <coughs> cases are, uh, so you are, uh, so converting to, so which tech, which uh, procedure is the most common after a sleep gastrectomy that uh, uh, you recommend? So first thing what I'll do is I will see what was the starting weight of the patient. The patient was super obese, a super, super obese, then I will always, always recommend a SADI procedure to this patient because that's the best weight loss procedure. But if the patient was not that big to begin with, then I would probably recommend uh, doing a gastrographic swallow or a barium study to see if there is abnormal uh, dilatation of the fundus of the stomach or the antrum. I've tried my hand with uh, antrectomy, fundectomy, resizing the sleeve and everything. Long term, it doesn't seem to work, Imran. This is my honest opinion. Uh, so if you've got uh, average weight regain with reflux, I would recommend a Ruamai gastric bypass. If it's without reflux, then you can always consider gastric bypass.
Yes, sir. Sir, my question. So, just imagine. Yes, uh, there is uh, no, no, no fundus, and also that was a standard sleep that you did, and also you will see the pouch is no issue. No need to resize the pouch. There is no reflux. Only weight regain. Now, just imagine four years after surgery, and also patient gain weight. It was now one thirty, one thirty five after a sleep. So again, it is same weight. Uh, so, so if we compare two procedures, one anastomosis gastric bypass and sadi, and you know better than me, sadi is little tricky and more difficult as compared to um, uh, mini gastric bypass. Which procedure you prefer and why? If the patients come back again to 130 kgs, uh, Imran, and if I have the skill sets that let's say someone like you or uh, some of us have, then I would not uh, shy away from doing a sadi because I know it's a much superior procedure. In sadi, you're leaving 300 centimeters of common channel or 250 centimeters of common channel. With the only anastomosis gastric bypass, yes, you will get weight loss, but you will not get as much as sadi. So if you're doing it for weight regain, it's technically far easier to do than the sadi. There's no doubt about that. But remember, you're measuring distance from the DJ. In the other one, you're measuring distance from the IC. So you have no concept of how much common channel there is in a single anastomosis gastric bypass. Let's say you're stuck with a small bowel, which is around one to 1.5 meters long, then your OAGB will not seem to work uh, for weight loss. Sir, if we define uh, OAGB or MGB, so you know better than me. So when anastomosis gastric bypass, we always measure whole length of bowel till in initial and also in uh, revisional surgeries, and the protocol by Professor Carbajo is the pioneer of an anastomosis gastric bypass that is 60-40. So we will go, we will bypass 60% of small bowel and we must uh, so save about 300 uh, centimeter common channel. So that is also like sadi. That's, that's, that's as good as sadi. That's as good as sadi. But the classical MGB described by Dr. Rutledge and all is not that much. Professor Carbao's is uh, completely different because, in fact, Dr. Rutledge, uh, Dr. Kular, and their team, they actually do believe that even 200 centimeter bypass is too much of malabsorption. Therefore, in certain areas, they are recommending that you go to 175, 150, and don't do up to 200 centimeters. So just imagine bypassing two thirds of that bowel uh, might cause might cause a lot of malnutrition and stuff. Add that reflux component as well. So don't forget the elephant in the room that there is always going to be some degree of reflux with the sleep. Sir, why am I asking this question? So because this is very important question. So if I can convey my question, because if we compare Saadi and uh, uh, one anastomosis gastric bypass, I can ask a mini or single anastomosis gastric bypass, what is the main difference? So if patient is not suffering with GERD and there is no issue, only there is weight regain. So when we will go for SADI, then it will be, so do you know jejunostomy? So that is small bowel with small bowel. We also save our pylorus and there is no direct contact of small bowel with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with stomach. And so then there is, so overall if we think this is more physiologic procedure, just uh, so yes, this is a little tricky, little difficult. So then we can see, yes, the so duodenum to jejunum, that is also we can see, so this is the natural. And also we have saved our, uh, this pylorus. So why I am asking, because you have excellent experience. If we see long time uh, follow up of these two, two, two types of so sadi with one anastomosis gastric bypass, and then we can give them weightage. So in anastomosis, yes, we have same like BP lame, we have uh, same like sadi common channel. There is this male absorptive or hypoabsorptive component is like sadi, but the, what is the difference? So in 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 oh, anastomosis gastric bypass, so this is gastrojejunostomy, but here they do not jejunostomy. Have you any study about this, or you can think about this so we can compare, like marginal ulcer like so reflux, like other issues that we can face in one anastomosis gastric bypass. So in both Imran, it's going to be a duodenal ileostomy or a gastroileostomy. 
right? So when you're doing that, you're anastomosing with the ileum, 300 centimeters from the IC. Yeah. You're almost closing to the ileum and not the jejunum. So you bypass the whole of jejunum. Uh, there is almost no chance of a marginal ulcer when you anastomose with the duodenum. That we all agree. There is always going to be a theoretical chance and that is why the diverted uh, uh, single anastomosis uh, gastroileostomy, the sagi, yeah. right? A lot of people have done that and there is there is marginal ulcer. So uh, Professor Almao from Brazil who recommends that procedure has not spoken too much about that marginal ulcer. But the fact is that not too many people have taken that up because the exact amount of anastomosis has to be calculated because if you do too much, then everything gets dumped into the ileum and you have a very, very large segment of the small bowel, which has a high tendency to developing a, a SIBO, uh, right? Spontaneous uh, intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So we have to be a little careful when we're uh, doing all this. Whereas if you were to personally ask me, whether do I, do I have an experience with bypassing so much of the small gut and then only an asymptomatic gastric bypass, I don't have. So I don't know if any study that has been done to compare these two, but people who are doing it, maybe Dr. Carvalho and maybe Dr. Antonio Torres should compare their data and results to try and give us the answer. Sir, in my opinion, this will be interesting because uh, now still the bariatric surgery, in my opinion, is, uh, is has a long and hard journey uh, to standardize. So which uh, which type is must be initial and also it, it depends on ethnicity and dietary protocol. Maybe we cannot standardize for uh, all the globe, but uh, okay, we can standardize regionally. Yes, in South Asia, this is good surgery. In Asia Pacific, this is good surgery. In Europe, yes, we can maybe, maybe in future, but especially regional because now it is. So we are facing this phenomena and we will face more and more, especially after the sleeve gastrectomy. And this is the time the persons like you, that you are decision maker at IFSO level, at, at very big levels. So in my opinion, you must go ahead because this will be a, a great message also for all of us. So we need uh, such a uh, guidance uh, uh, from uh, so big names like you and others so to, because we can compare these studies. So if you see, yes, Saadi is tricky, difficult, but more physiologic. As you have uh, mentioned, so yes, this diverted Saadi are also now, Rui started that diverted uh, OAGB, definite more chance of marginal ulcer because the bile, the bile also has some buffering effect. There is no doubt. So because we see marginal ulcer in uh, Ruan Y is much more than one anastomosis. So one of the reason is maybe that buffering effect of bile that we have in one anastomosis gastric bypass, but we have no bile in, in Ruan Y. Even in Ruan Y is a small pouch, small amount of acid, but more marginal ulcer as compared to uh, this uh, one anastomosis. Uh, so we appreciate, sir, if we can go ahead and uh, and the person like Carbajo and Antonio Torres, uh, so they can uh, so work on it. Uh, and I will also contact directly with uh, So I, this is a good idea. I will talk with them. So can we do such a thing? And if we, it will be great, I think. Yeah, it's a good idea. We should actually compare and we should know the kind of problems that do happen. If there's some honest, I think you get very, very good uh, studies there. Yeah, sir, 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 so much thanks. Sir, this is a little political question regarding endoscopic gastroplasty. Yes, you have uh, excellent uh, experience regarding endoscopic bariatric surgery, especially for uh, complication of bariatric surgery. What's your opinion about initial uh, endoscopic gastroplasty? So I think it's a, it's a, it's a great procedure uh, for the lower BMIs. You must understand that it's got its own limitations. It kind of fits in between the balloon and the, the kind of sleeve. Uh, if you are expecting around a 15 to 20% uh, total body weight loss in that segment of patients is good enough. It's uh, not without its flaws. It has its own set of complications. Uh, you need a, a more steeper learning curve than you do need with uh, a sleeve gastrectomy. Remember the gastric plication has failed us previously, the laparoscopic gastric plication. Well, the, the 
promoters of the endoscopic sleeve will argue that it's not the same procedure and this is a much more technically uh, better procedure. But if you look at the data closely and people who've done it, you, you realize that a lot of these patients, are, a lot of these doctors are resorting to their multidisciplinary teams to give them that additional weight loss. So they're adding in maybe a glutide, some other form of uh, therapy along with the endoscopic sleeve to manage that weight loss. Uh, so your patient should be aware that uh, that is the amount of weight loss he should be looking at and he should not be disappointed by expecting miraculous results with the endoscopic sleep. Sir, excellent. Sir, so because uh, I think this is the time to, to go and I, I really, I, am, I don't like to end this uh, session, but because we have some limitation, it was really great session. Uh, you have shared your personal experience and also you have tried your best to convey your message about safe sleeve gastrectomy. Sir, your message for our youngsters who are just now going to start sleeve gastrectomy. All I want to tell you is that please go ahead. It's a great field to be in bariatric surgery. Remember that don't do it only because uh, you want to get into bariatric surgery. Do it because you are, you, you're very fond of it. It's a lifelong career. Uh, don't do a procedure because that's the only procedure you know. Learn all the other procedures as well. Uh, don't shy away from taking help from some seniors if you get stuck in a case. Remember that endoscopic management and relaparoscopy are far better options than exploratory laparotomy in a complication with the sleeve. There are many other things like uh, uh, which are done endoscopically today to manage a leak in a sleeve. <coughs> Please use your your friends and whoever's talented in endoscopy to do that. And most of, importantly, like Imran said, please follow up your patients regularly. If they don't follow up, make, make sure that you follow up with them to the best of your efforts. Because uh, somewhere down the line, when they need another surgery, they should come to you and not, not somebody else. May God bless you all. Inshallah, I'll see you soon. Sir, so my thanks and I uh, hope see you soon in Dubai or any other, uh, because now due to COVID-19, we have some limitations, but uh, soon see you another international conference and also in Dubai, sir. Sir, really appreciable. I know you are so much busy and also midnight uh, in India until this time, you are live with us and also my viewers, so much thanks for your follow up and these sessions are due to your support and your help. If you have any question, you can ask question in comments. Professor will respond to you. And also we will continue this series of safe sleep gastrectomy. Next week we will have, we will be with another legend of bariatric surgery. And we need your support. If you have any question, please you can contact me directly and also you can ask in comments. So again, so much thanks, really appreciable. And also we need your support and guidance. Thank you, Imran. And Allah uh, is to everyone. Thank, Thank you, sir. Allah